anyone worth their sea salt will know a good adventure starts with a route plan, which includes a map, a tidal chart and a weather forecast for the duration of adventure. It was my friends the kayakers who suggested going into Loch Hurn from Glen Elg, as the route fitted perfectly with the tides and forecasts. The tidal chart is vital for kayakers and small displacement speedboats as going with the tidal flows greatly assists the passage. I know my heavily laden Ephrib can only go at a top speed of around 5 knots, therefore I can't make headway into a 5 knot or more tidal flow. However, it can go a healthy land speed of 10 knots going with the flow. The tide chart, used in conjunction with the weather forecast wind direction and strengths, ensures that wind against tide situations which can cause large breaking waves are avoided as much as possible. It's why the guys chose the Loch Huron route. It fitted in well with the tidal flow times and wind directions. Example, the northeasterly wind and ebbing tide would assist the passage down the Sound of Sleet. Our route started at Glen Elg and went down the Sound of Sleet into Loch Huron and then on to Kinloch Huron at the very tip of the loch, before returning to Glen Elg again. A distance of only 40 miles, but that was through some of Scotland's most remote and scenic countryside. So distance didn't matter, as we wanted plenty of time to savour the atmosphere of the area. We arranged to meet up at the 11am on Wednesday the 28th of April in the Shore Car Park north of Glen Elg. I arrived at the same time as my brother Douglas and we readied our boats on the beach. Unfortunately for me, the tide was a long way out, so I had several trips carrying all my camping gear to the boat, which I also had to carry to the water's edge. The other kayakers arrived as I kept myself fit by hiking back and forth. Being of sounder mind than myself, they then brought their boats to the water the easy way. Well, all but one. They then finished setting up their kayaks as I readied the guppy. I knew they were now going to have to work hard as I took things easy, letting my six horsepower outboard do the work their arms would have to do. Although by using the last of the ebbing tide and some wind, they didn't seem to break too much sweat. I, on the other hand, decided to take a quick detour in the opposite direction and give my outboard a good workout in the Kyle Rhea overfalls. These are marked on the marine charts as dangerous for small boats and I wanted to find out why, bearing in mind I could only go at displacement speed because of the weight I was carrying in the boat. Personally, I didn't think they were too dangerous even if it was spring tides. I do appreciate that if wind had been blowing against the tide, then it could have been a totally different situation. I also knew that because my boat only had a top speed of 5 knots and the flow was approaching 8 knots, I wasn't going to go any further, so turned round and went back to rejoin the kayakers. And I was now going a healthy land speed of 10 plus knots. Five from the outboard and five or more from the tidal flow. In 
initially, as we headed down the sound of sleet towards the Sandig Islands, the kayakers kept well offshore. This was because an early flood stream was now starting to flow back up the sound along the shore edge, which would have hindered their progress, but it didn't bother my outboard in the slightest. Although everyone is happy that I go by internal combustion instead of paddle power, I keep my distance from everyone so as not to disturb their paddling experience with my noisy outboard. At times I scoot ahead to scout out the area and contact the guys by handheld VHF if required. I was first to land in the Sandig Islands where we had planned on setting up camp for the night. It gave me time to set up the camera to capture the guys as they came ashore. which was just in time as a strengthening northwest wind was blowing against the now incoming tide, causing white waves to form on the surface. I didn't like leaving my boat on the exposed side of the island, so decided to move it to the shelter side. I got absolutely soaked in the heavy laden boat during a nasty squall and shipped quite a bit of water. The kayakers simply carried their kayaks up the beach to safer ground. So I was a little damp, but a lot happier my boat was in a more sheltered area as we set up camp on the Sandig Islands. And for those of you who are not familiar with the area, this is where Gavin Maxwell, the author of Ring of Bright Water, lived with his otters. He called it Camus Verna to hide its true location. And what a lovely place it is. No wonder he loved to live here. and I pitched my tent in the middle of it all. We then spent the rest of the day catching up and swapping tales of other adventures, scoffing some delicious homemade chicken casserole, lit the campfire and enjoyed an abundant evening swally, telling more stories until it was time for bed. The bitter north wind ensured I had a cold night in the tent, but I woke to a lukewarm sun shining in the canvas, and I got up to a lovely clear morning. After a big bowl of cereal and a gallon of hot coffee, we dismantled the campsite and I watched the kayakers getting their boats in the water for 9.30am.
We knew the brisk north-westerly wind would assist us towards Loch Huern, and the tidal flow would be negligible as it was at high water. I gave him a little start, then jumped in my own boat and followed him, leaving the lovely Sandig Islands in my wake. It didn't take long to catch up, as they too are paddling heavily laden sea kayaks, full of camping gear, beer, wine and whisky, as well as home-cooked food ready for a quick reheat. I went on ahead and then waited behind the little island, where a colony of seals had set up their camp. The inquisitive seals were as interested in us as we were of them, and they followed the kayakers for several miles. I've never seen them follow my outboard motorboat though. I guess they have no interest in internal combustion engines. The panoramic views across to the mighty cool in the sky soon distracted me from the sight of common seals. And as I was now choking for another coffee, I landed in a little out of the way bay for a brew up on the beach. I knew I was not the first person to be here, as the ruins and old croft lay in the grass behind the beach. As I entered its threshold, I wondered what its owners were like and why they left the house with such a pretty view. I guess they would tell me it just became far too hard to live here anymore. Especially if you don't like fish every day for your dinner. I guess I could understand that, and I certainly wouldn't like to live without the internet nowadays. So I clambered back into my boat and left the lovely out of the way bay behind. The kayakers crossed the entrance to Loch Hearn and went along the southern shore, while I decided to go along the northern shore. I was hoping some early morning sun would break through below the clouds and illuminate the lovely landscape. As it was now lunchtime, I decided to pull over for an hour's beach brew up, a bite to eat and to soak in the stunning scenery. The mountains are magnificent, and in a past life I'm pleased to say that I have stood on many of their summits. And having scoffed a spicy Tesco's macaroni pie, it was time to head back in the boat and head into Loch Hell, which Loch Huron is often known as. In all 
all I can say is that if this is hell, who needs heaven? As the wide angle lens of a GoPro doesn't give the mountains a true height, I pulled over and landed and used the camcorder to capture Lara Ben. Many a mountain man will tell you this is the best one in the area. And it truly is a magnificent rocky mountain. Accessible only by boat or a tough 20 mile hike over the rough bounds of Noidart. And if coming by boat, you have to be careful not to get stranded by the low tide in Barrasdale Bay. It was while I was admiring mountains that the VHF radio crackled. It was my brother Douglas saying that they were going to land for a late lunch in a little bay not too far from where I was. So I backtracked a little to meet up with them again. It wasn't too difficult spotting a brightly coloured kayak on a drab mill pond. We landed and ate the late lunch, but as I'd already eaten, I took in the magnificent views instead. After a quick catch up, I decided to push on to a proposed campsite for the night. At Collis Moor, the Narrows, where a flat strip of land was perfect for pitching tents. I could see some nasty squalls collecting over the hilltops. Luckily the rain stayed in the tops and I reached the narrows and dry. It was low tide so I left the guppy at anchor as I set my tent up above high water mark. What a lovely remote place it is to have a night's wild camp, assuming there is not a gale force wind blowing. My plan was to unload the guppy at the campsite so I could get her to go on the plane, so I could quickly go to the end of the loch in case the weather deteriorated. I set off in my now empty boat just as the kayakers started to arrive. It was a great feeling being able to plane again after almost two days at displacement speeds. And unknown to me at the time, my brother was also videoing me at the Narrows. A small boat and a big landscape. The Narrows can be very tidal and a bit of a challenge for small boats when the wind is against tide. But it was flat calm this day and I zipped through them in no time. However, as soon as I was through, the squall hit, and torrential rain with a ferocious wind that whipped up the waves forced me to land until it passed by. It only lasted for five minutes, and by that time everyone else had arrived, and everyone decided to head for the bottom of the lock as well.
Lanoch Hurn technically ends in a dog leg and a narrow channel leading into the small Loch Beg at Kinloch Hurn. And as it was just after low tide on just after springs, the channel was rather shallow. Worried about grounding the propeller, I switched out, board off and let the current carry me through. I restarted it as the water gradually deepened, and soon I was in Little Loch Beg. It's true I was only 20 miles from where we parked the cars, but what a 20 mile journey it had been. And of course, I knew the adventure was only halfway through, as we had to return to Glenelg. I turned the boat and used shallow drive to power my way back through the shallow channel against the incoming tide. Passing the kayakers on the way back, I advise them not to bother going into Little Loch Beg, as they may have a terrible job paddling against the incoming tide. They were happy enough to continue to the end of Loch Huern and then turn back. I headed back for a little bit more, then pulled over and landed to get some video footage of them coming back down the loch. Then, once back at the coolest moor narrows, everyone else set about setting up their tents. Then we set about collecting firewood and getting a campfire going. Note that we never build the fires on the grass, we always build them on the shore. There's absolutely no need to burn grass or build stone circles to leave for others to find. We scoffed our dinners and swapped whiskies and tails as we watched the ever-changing views. We watched all four seasons pass by Loch Huern yeah. as we toasted toes beside the campfire. And then it was time for bed. It was another bitter cold night and in the morning the tents were fringed with frost, but it was a beautiful blue sky and sunny morning. I clambered up a small hill behind the tent to get my circulation going. The view over Loch Huern was truly magnificent. Then I went to investigate a strange bubbling noise. We presumed it was air getting trapped in the shingle at low tide, 
and then the high tide was forcing it back to the surface, but a strange phenomenon indeed. I was in no hurry, so once we dismantled camp, I leisurely watched the kayaker setting off down the loch. Then I jumped in the guppy and set off myself. It was one of these lovely calm mornings where I liked to reflect on the beauty of my surroundings. However, behind me the squall started to collect in the hills surrounding the inner end of the loch. The kayakers were in no hurry either. They enjoyed exploring every nook and cranny of the remote shoreline. They had plenty of time for relaxed conversation and were often eavesdropped upon by following seals. If you wonder what it's like travelling in a kayak at a slow speed at the edge of the loch, I also just pottered along in the shallows admiring the underwater scenery as well as the above water scenery. For me, boating in such a beautiful location is not about going fast. It's about taking time to smell the seaweed. And a versatile guppy is almost as good as a kayak for doing that. And after a leisurely journey, we eventually arrived back at the Sandig Islands where we set up camp for the night. We enjoyed a dinner of curry and potatoes, baked in the fire, followed by melted mallows and whiskey while watching the sun go down. On the morning of day four, after another cold night, I sadly said goodbye to the Sandig Islands and also to the kayakers and made my way back to Glen Elg. Another adventure was over. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.